Hi guys, welcome back. Thanks for joining me for another Royal News video. I hope your week is off to a good start and you all had wonderful weekends. I slept like a baby at the weekend because I had been so stressed about the dog Chia being sick and then the nervousness of going to Castle Goring and interviewing the fabulous Lady C. Obviously that turned into a big adventure but it was ever so uh, draining with worrying about the dog and then editing two lots of videos. It was just a very cool experience but I was truly exhausted. It got a Saturday night and I realised I hadn't even had a glass of wine. I had about two glasses of wine and out like a light. <laughs> and welcome to everybody, all the new subscribers. It's amazing. Do you know that video has got over 200,000 views already? And for me, that's insane. I'm ever so grateful, but I do remember like it was yesterday when I got my first 100 subscribers and then people were watching like a thousand views per video. So this, thank you to everyone. You really do add to the magic of this channel for me. So speaking of which, let's get on with some royal news and we're going to start with an anniversary. Today is actually King Charles and Queen Camilla's 19th wedding anniversary. I personally think that those two have an incredible love story and whilst people did obviously get hurt as what happens unfortunately when there's children, marriages and affairs and much alike, they fought tooth and nail in life to be together and for the public to accept the union. It's not been easy for Camilla. She was once one of the most hated women in the world but it would seem that her daughter-in-law, stepdaughter-in-law has in fact taken that crown. Whilst I personally don't waste my time on something as strong as hatred towards Harry and Meghan, I do think that they are heavily disliked. Queen Camilla has proved herself over the years. She just got on with it, stuck her head down, never complained. She just took it all on the chin, turned the other cheek, and here we have her now, where she has earned a lot of the public's respect and admiration. And it's very clear that Charles and Camilla absolutely adore each other. I really like watching them as a couple. They always seem to be laughing and joking to the point of hysterics sometimes. And that to me proves that those two are quite clearly the best of friends. I can imagine that they have also been a great support to each other as well. Camilla has been Charles's rock through not just the loss of Prince Philip, but also the Queen, the horridness of horrid Henry, and then of course becoming King and she becoming his Queen consort and now with the cancer battle. I know that some people will never ever warm to Camilla and that's absolutely fine. But for me personally, I really, really like her and I wish the King and the Queen a very lovely and wonderful 19th wedding anniversary. So let's move on to another special anniversary event, 120 years since the Entente Cordiale, which was a series of agreements signed by the Republic of France and the UK in 1904, which strengthened relations between the two countries. For the first time in history, 32 French soldiers, the Gendarmerie Guard Republican and 40 guardsmen from the Scots Guards took part in changing of the guards held at Buckingham Palace. The event was attended by Hélène Duchesne, the French ambassador to the UK, and the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, who were representing the King. Incredible photographs were taken throughout the parade and the day. Sophie looked especially beautiful in a really simple pale blue dress and a cream coat. And the Duke, Prince Edward, he looked to not only be in good spirits, but he looks so much better than what we've seen him look in recent months. It looks like that he started to put on the much needed weight again back in his face and he's beginning to look much like his old self. Now I have had a few people message me saying, do you think that he was hiding a secret health condition? I don't. I honestly think that Prince Edward and Sophie were incredibly close to Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth. And I think it hit them both incredibly hard with Prince Edward being the youngest son to lose both parents in such quick succession. It's hard for any of us, no matter our age, to lose our parents, but to lose both so quickly. I think that is why Edward had lost weight and he was just looking just not himself for some time. Now in another anniversary, it's a slightly sad anniversary, but it's been three years officially since we lost Prince Philip. Yes, it's hard to believe that the former Duke of Edinburgh's passing was three years ago and I honestly still miss him. 
He, in so many ways, was a strong patriarch of the family. And since he stepped back and he retired, as it were, and then unfortunately became unwell, all sorts of shenanigans started happening that I think that if a younger and healthier Prince Philip had been more involved, it would have stopped a certain someone in her tracks. I wouldn't say that they would have stopped the marriage from happening, but I think there would have been a hell of a lot more rules in place. And I don't think that they would have got away with half of their behaviour especially towards Queen Elizabeth. It's always said that Prince Philip was the iron fist behind the throne and I absolutely believe that without question. Prince Philip historically was the longest serving British royal consort and not only that his marriage to Queen Elizabeth II was the longest in British royal history. Prince Philip was known for being politically incorrect and dropping some comments and jokes that would have the modern day woke community drowning in their tears. But he was actually known for being very witty, very funny and very charming, as long as you didn't piss him off. <laughs> Prince Philip led an incredible life, but it wasn't all roses either. He was the youngest child of five and the only son to Princess Alice of Battenberg and Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark. Princess Alice was born in Windsor and she was actually born deaf, but learnt sign language and became fluent in English, German and Greek. Sadly, not long after Prince Philip was eight years old, she suffered a mental breakdown and she was committed to a Swiss sanitarium and diagnosed with schizophrenia. His father had actually left them in 1930. It was rumoured that he was too busy pursuing his own love life and this led to Prince Philip being carted off to many boarding schools across many countries. He had schooling in France, Germany, England and eventually I would say he settled more in Scotland where he was inspired and taught by headmaster Kurt Hahn. Hahn had founded and also served as the headmaster at Salem School in southwestern Germany where he first met Prince Philip as a student. This was until 1933 when Hitler then rose to power and being Jewish himself, he called out Hitler publicly, which then led to his arrest. Thankfully, he was soon released when the then British Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, had intervened and he left Germany for the UK. When he then founded Gordonstown School in Scotland and Prince Philip became one of the very first pupils. It was rumoured that he was the man that inspired Prince Philip to in fact join the Navy at 18 years old. To marry his bride, Princess Elizabeth, Prince Philip then had to not just turn his back on some of his German side of the family because of the choices that they had made in World War II, but he also then had to give up all of his princely titles. He became a British citizen and changed his surname to Mount Batten, which was an anglicised version of his mother's name, Battenberg. Their first two children, Prince Charles and Princess Anne, were originally given the surname of Windsor. Prince Philip was reportedly very unhappy with this, and after Prince Andrew was born, the Queen and the Duke had said that they wanted their children to carry both of their names to distinguish them from the rest of the royal family. So in 1960, the Privy Council made Mount Batten Windsor the official surname of the descendants of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip. He gave up absolutely everything to be with the woman that he loved, to forever walk two steps behind his queen. Prince Philip supported the Queen throughout her entire life, having met her when she was 13 years old. These two really are such a beautiful love story and they were together for 74 years. He also not only dedicated his life to his wife and the Queen and the United Kingdom, he also put duty over personal feelings. He also created the Duke of Edinburgh Awards that has benefited over 3 million British children by challenging them to learn new skills, self-improvement and learning to believe in themselves. The Duke of Edinburgh Awards has since expanded to 144 nations. Prince Philip had over 800 patronages, charities and various military appointments and attended over 22,000 engagements over the course of his life of service. He was an inspirational man and I'm not surprised one bit that he walked out of Sandringham before his traitor grandson had arrived to make a bid for his money-making smash and grab that he and Meghan had devised and launched onto the elderly queen after being given absolutely everything by the royal family. 
Harry sadly has turned out to be a man that is not even a fraction of the man that his grandfather Prince Philip was, who himself went through a lot of real trauma as a child. He was brought up surrounded by his mother's mental health issues, abandoned by his father, carted off to several boarding schools, several countries. He fought in World War II and had to turn his back against certain family members due to them being on the wrong side. And yet he has never complained. He gave up everything to be with the woman that he loved and he dedicated his entire life, not just to her, but to her country and to the Commonwealth and has spent many years using his platform, his privileges and his experience to help others and leave a legacy that will now live on through his youngest son, Prince Edward. Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip are definitely one of the greatest royal couples throughout history and that's why I will never ever forgive Harry and Meghan for what they did to them in their final years. I will never forget that Meghan said that the palace made up Prince Philip's ill health to try and muzzle her from speaking out on Oprah. And then after his passing at his funeral, telling the newspapers, telling the media outlets or her mouthpieces to do her dirty work, which wreath was actually hers, which flowers that she had handpicked and why she had chosen them to be displayed. Meghan somehow didn't have enough respect to come to Prince Philip's funeral, but she would in fact make sure Sure that the media knew that her presence was there and involved in some way. I also will not forget sources close to the couple who complained that it was bad luck because of Prince Philip's ill health and his passing that had overshadowed their Oprah interview. Translation, they were blaming Prince Philip for the backlash that they got for doing that Oprah tell-all and then they blamed archetypes flopping on the Queen's passing. This was leaked to the media by sources and friends of the couple, which we know is Harry and Meghan's favourite way to communicate their true feelings. As we know, there is never any moment for Harry and Meghan to say, hey, perhaps we are part of the problem. There's no accountability or responsibility for any of their actions or the decisions that they, as a couple, have made. So it shouldn't come as a shock to you, because it certainly didn't me, that Meghan is already lining up her ducks to pass the blame again. Apparently, Meghan is pausing her launch of American Riviera Orchard to avoid looking opportunistic. Um, are you okay, Megan? When the hell has Megan ever put a second thought out there to say, oh, this might look like that I am doing another smash and grab. I might be taking advantage of something. Megan does not care. She wouldn't give two hoots about the way it looks. Perhaps WME or whoever it is that's meant to be representing her these days said, oh, this does actually look a little bit bad, your timing, Megan. But again, when has Megan ever listened to anyone that's ever tried to give her advice? Meghan apparently now cares that it would look bad for her to launch her new venture, start selling her wares and tears and doing a cookery channel and book, smack bang in the middle of the King and Catherine's cancer battle. I don't believe this. This is a spin that is being put out by her people as far as I'm concerned. If Meghan truly cared about the King and Catherine, do you not think that she and Harry would have put out a statement to slap down Endgame when Omid accidentally on purpose got the names leaked of Catherine and the King being the ones that were the royal racists? No, Harry and Meghan managed to stay strangely quiet on that one. Meghan hasn't given a single damn about the man that raised her, loved her and gave her every single opportunity to live the life that she has led. Her father, Thomas Markle, has had two heart attacks and she has completely estranged herself from him, got her friends to attack him in People magazine and tried to stir up so much hatred, of course by her own squad members as well, her toxic fan base, to target her family as well as anyone that calls out the couple for their behaviour and misdemeanours. But we're now suddenly meant to believe that Meghan cares about Catherine and the King's battle so much that she doesn't want to push her own business venture. I'll tell you the real reason why Meghan's now putting this spin out there. It's because as of today's date, where just minutes before I started filming this, I checked her Instagram number of followers. She hasn't even cleared 600,000 and it's been launched weeks ago. 
The fact that several newspapers and people have looked at some of her followers that have all got private accounts and the ones that don't, don't have a single post on Instagram, tells you that there is a large number of them that look like that they are paid, bought for bots. Whether Megan's bought them for herself or whether other people have bought them for Megan is another story. But the fact is, it doesn't look organic or authentic, the words that Megan loves to use. I can tell you now, I'm on Instagram and I follow some of the strangest accounts. I've got one woman that I follow, she doesn't talk in her videos, all she does is pull funny facial expressions. I follow a cow farmer who is so funny. These women have thousands, thousands more followers than what Megan does. The fact is that a lot of Megan's Followers don't seem to be genuine either. This is an epic fail before it's even got off the ground. Megan had no products ready, no staff ready, no trademark ready. All she had available was a Vaseline smeared creepy video post, which to be fair, as the Royal Rogue referenced it, it looks like the creepy video that you watch before you die in the ring. It's clear that this venture is not getting the backing or the interest that she thought it would. So now stories of how she sacrificed her launch out of the kindness of her heart, the respect for Catherine and the King are surfacing. So no, I do not believe that Meghan has suddenly become a caring and compassionate person. I believe it's going the same way as 40 by 40 by Meghan's book, The Bench, where she was going to be an acclaimed children's author, where she was going to be the queen of podcasts. She was going to overthrow Joe Rogan, if you remember. Then she was going to take a senator's seat, wasn't she? Meghan is constantly throwing something at the wall in hope that something will stick and it just falls into the void that is very much Meghan Markle. Now, speaking of which, we know that Meghan has got one of 100 personalities on the go at any given time. We have got the caring Meghan, then we've got the feminist Meghan, then we've got the homely Meghan, the mummy Meghan. It's endless, the different types of uh, personalities that Meghan likes to reinvent herself into. There's no continuity. You never know from one week to the next which Meghan we're actually going to get. But because of obviously the American election, Elections. That is beginning to ramp up. As you can imagine, Megan has decided she's going to stick her toe back in those waters. But worryingly, she's dragged along her husband, Harry, along for the ride. That is something that I think the American Democrats and Republicans will probably be able to agree on for once. And that is keep your British prince out of our politics. But I'll talk more about that, guys, in my next video. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like this might be a three video week. So join me for my next video, guys, and take care and I'll see you soon. Bye.